I think for me, it's that swimming coach relationship, like mm. knowing that you're actually supported. Mm. And like many coaches say it, but like knowing that you're supported, not just as a swimmer, but as a person, um, I find really useful. Hmm. Having that like extra support and knowing that they're actually genuinely like there for you. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. And like we mentioned at the end of last week's episode with Matthew Ward, we are heading up to Scotland on this week's episode as we are speaking to University of Stirling breaststroker Ang Harrod Evans. Yeah, we continue our lineup of amazing guests to start the new year. This week, Ang Harrod joins us from Sterling to talk about her recent progress as her results in the breaststroke events have been very strong, yep. as well as what she thinks what she can do when the British Olympic trials come around at the London Aquatic Centre. Yeah, so when you talk about recent performances, Dan, like being very strong, I'm just going to read a stat to our listeners, or actually her performances at the Rotterdam Open Meet in early December 2023. So she mm. hit a one second PB in the 50 meters breaststroke. She were knocked off just under a second in a 100 meters breaststroke to go a 107.27 and knocked off seven seconds off her 200 breaststroke to go at a 226.84, which mm. firmly puts her in the picture for several breaststroke titles when it comes to Olympic trials in a few months time, which is why we've invited her onto the podcast this week to talk about her journey because when you search the name Ang Harrod Evans, not much comes up. So yep. we'd love to share a little bit about her journey through the sport, how she got up to Sterling from her home club of West Suffolk and what she's actually working on right now in the pool with Steve Tigg and Bradley Hay. So please welcome onto the podcast this week, University of Sterling breaststroker Ang Harrod Evans. And Harrod, thank you for coming on to the podcast this week. How has the start of the winter months been for you? Um, kind of, it's a, it's a tough life up in there, Scotland, when it's all dark and rainy this time of year. Yeah, uh, definitely cold. Rain's actually my favourite weather, so that hasn't oh, been. Really? Yeah, above yeah above the sun. So um, why that hasn't been? I don't know. I feel like it makes me want to like Sing lie in bed and <laughs> have tea oh. or something. I don't know. I feel like it's cozy, you know. Okay. I get like annoyed with the sun, but yeah, so training's been good. I think um, the meters have definitely gone up since it's been kind of a block of racing. Mm. So um, it's kind of like been topping up the meters and getting mm. back to training, but it's been good. All Keeping me busy. <laughs> yeah, all of the fun stuff this time of year that the elite teams <laughs> have to go through. Now, before we talk about your like recent success and how Sterling are getting the best out of you, We'd love to kind of share your journey with our listeners. So what clubs maybe deserve a shout out and where have you been on your journey to get to Sterling at this point? Um, West Suffolk is the first one that comes to mind. That's um, just kind of my local club at home, but it's where I like learned to swim. They kind of got me to my first nationals, um, which was exciting. And the coach there, Down Pilbara, has been amazing with me. You know, I've had... um like times when I've stopped swimming or like haven't enjoyed swimming, but he's kind of always been there. Um, and then I was at University of Georgia for a bit, um, but the training there was completely different than what I was used to. I kind of train like six to seven times a week at home, which is not a lot compared to, you know, most swimmers. Um, mm. Then jumping up to nine, but it wasn't the jump in training sessions. It was more like my meters just doubled. So it was like, not quality over quantity um but yeah so <laughs> so where's where's the love for swimming come from originally west suffolk and dan <laughs> it was definitely say that he definitely taught me how to love swimming i think there's with swimming it's like easy to fall out of love with it mm -hmm. just purely because of how often you're in the pool um so yeah and really what, enjoyed what, it back home <laughs> and what did he do to keep you uh, motivated and inspired and want to turn up every day um I think for me it's that swimming coach relationship like mm. knowing that you're actually supported mm. and like many coaches say it but like knowing that you're supported not just as a swimmer but as a person um I find really useful mm. having that like extra support and knowing that they're actually genuinely like there for you so 
Do you mm. still have that relationship with your old club and your old coach even yeah. now that you're all the way in Scotland? Yeah, there's been meets at like Bucks and stuff and I'm messaging him. I'm like, I just did this time. And it's <laughs> it's definitely nice to have that still support. Um, so, yeah. What, so, so what's what's made the move from West Suffolk? Because it sounds like you've had some pretty promising and positive memories there. Why yeah. did you want to then leave to then go to Sterling? What's what's preempted that? Um, I think there wasn't a university close enough where I could train there, and then also swim there. But it was also um, getting to the point where like I knew I needed to do more sessions. You know, pick okay. it up from six or seven so it was a mixture of that um and yeah just getting a degree picking up the training um Mm. so Mm. that was where i sparked the move (laughs) when you say you knew that training needed to increase it's i don't know it's kind of rare from my experience going through swimming that a swimmer actually gets to the senior level and they go i need to do more because (laughs) because I stopped when I was 16 or 17 and essentially it was, I was doing already at that point, how many sessions Dan would have done like 10 a week? Roughly yeah. speaking. Yeah. 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 Roughly speaking. I feel like you can't pick it up more than 10. That's, <laughs> that's the thing. You... There's no progression, I suppose. That, that was the <laughs> yeah. problem, I guess. So is it almost a benefit that you, I don't know how big a club West Suffolk is like, not forgive very me. big, not very, <laughs> very big. small. Okay. So is it almost a blessing that you've almost been kept in this, this environment? Mm-hmm. You've got the performances because at champs last year, you finished third in the hundred breaststroke. You've had these performances and now you've realized that you, you can make this jump. Like you've got that confidence in you that the love for swimming hasn't gone because you've not had the massive amount of training. Yes. Yeah. You, you said you had it at some level at Georgia, but like, Actually, did that Georgia experience make you realise when you were ready to move on to Sterling? Um, that's a, yeah, Georgia was, um, it kind of made me scared of volume. Um, okay. So I mm. definitely came back and I came back in December of last year, two years ago now. Um, and... I had stopped swimming for, I think, five months at that point just because I really was miserable. So then I started training again at West Suffolk only like five times a week um, mm. to just get back into it. And then that's when I kind of fell back in love with the sport and um, picked up a few more seven times a week. But um, <laughs> I definitely say it's useful going from that because then, you know, like worse comes to worse and like 10 training sessions and for me, you still have that like backup. But um I think the difference now is like I'm doing, you know, 10 sessions now, but it's a lot of like quality training over quantity. So like some days I'll go in and do like two and a half K rather than like knowing Mm -hmm. every single session, it's like six K and like, they're just Mm -hmm. train you till you can't. (laughs) Does it help that you know what your, what sessions you're going to be swimming beforehand? Yeah. It's actually the first time, um, like a program has done that that I've been part of, so yeah, I, it's I, nice. I could like mentally prepare before. Yeah, I have seen that Sterling do that because we went and saw Duncan for a day, and he was just mm-hmm. like, "Look, this is gonna be a really boring day. I'm sorry." <laughs> but he showed me like the whole session, and it was all recovery and whatever. And he knew yeah. exactly there was like the odd surprise of how a certain like set of yeah. hundreds was gonna work. Um, yeah, but it sounds like that's a really good like. A mental advantage for you going into your training yeah. sessions to know yeah that. each week like knowing how many meters you're on for each session is i find very useful like i know why i'm doing what i'm doing and mm. like everything has a purpose so, so part of that me. sterling setup then is to, from what i've seen is the amazing relationship that steve and bradley like have with mm-hmm. each other as well as with the swimmers so yeah. what is it that your finding is the key for your success up there right now because we'll get into your performances mm. shortly. <laughs> um as i said i think it's definitely that swimming coach relationship like i get on with brad so well and i think that's really helped me and he really does care for his swimmers as people mm. more than just like you know athletes um but they are i don't think there's a um Dull moment on full side. I think that they still are always joking around. Yeah, (laughs) it's so funny. It'll be like 
I don't know, threshold set and you'll be, you know, tired from the week and they'll just make you actually, you know, in a good mood, not negative. So, <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. It helps a lot. So what sort of sessions have they been giving you over the recent months before, let's say before Rotterdam, to, to get you into the Sterling, uh, set up the system and get this, like, there's been some massive improvements. Um, I think, so we started off, I would say, we did ease back into it, it was nice, yeah. but it was about, like, getting meters in, um, getting that fitness up especially coming from like five to 10. So they did like ease me in, which was nice. Um, and then it's a lot of like um, sprint. So we focus on lots of like power moves, like sprint, you know, a few times a week we'll like use the cameras, which is nice to mm. um, actually have those resources. And like, you're like used to, you know, feeling how you swim like every session, but like to see it, I mm. found like very useful. Um, and then we'll have like two key sets a week where it's more like endurance, um, like threshold, and then some recovery, some kick pull. But I found the um, I think the camera work the most useful. Yeah, I think that one of the 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 biggest standouts swims from Rotterdam was your two hundred breaststroke because I think you took yeah. off like seven seconds. <laughs> Is, do you reckon that's that's the aerobic base that you got out in Georgia from the distance side of it, and then you're combining that with the uh, the, the sprint side of it, the resistance stuff that you've been doing in uh, Sterling? I don't, I don't actually think Georgia had much to do with that. I think because no? at Chance I went 238 for 200 breaststroke. Um, and that was, I think the fastest I went last season training at West Suffolk was 235, I want to say. And mm. um, I think that's just from training, you know, a lot less than I do now. But, you know, picking up meters and sessions has definitely helped i think before that i'd never been sub 230 so that was my aim to go sub 230 and it was a nice surprise because usually i'm not known for the <laughs> the 200 breaststroke when you say you sub 230 it was a 226 that, that's <laughs> some way under it's a good chance. 230 is yeah, it like a little bit that. of a target or are you more of the 50 and the 100 is that what you prefer um definitely prefer the 50 and the 100 but I'm starting to enjoy the 200 a lot more now. I was actually excited for that final in Rotterdam. I think because there's less pressure on me to do yeah. well in the 200, so it's kind of like a free hit. So actually, we heard this. Who was who did we hear this from? Archie Goodburn. Yeah, he decided to start racing the hundred at uh, the 200 Two. a little while ago, and because he was known for the 50 and the 100, and suddenly he found he loves 200, even though yeah. the yeah. times aren't quite there, like in terms of like British level. Yeah. But he loves swimming it because it's one of those ones where no one's watching him. Like it's, exactly. It's a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, I surprised myself for that one as well. So, so hopefully in, it carries on. <laughs> so in the Sterling setup, who are your training partners there? Because when I think of breaststrokers up in Scotland, I immediately sorry sterling fans i go to edinburgh there's loads yeah. of them over in yeah. edinburgh so who are you training with when you're at sterling um i mean it depends on the set i would say holly mcgill who actually does backstroke okay is a good training buddy um we were actually racing 25s last night from the block trying to see <laughs> who can get to the wall first um but there's been some good breaststroke sets where i train with um like Rory Dixon and Callum Melville on like kick okay, sets yeah. and it gets pretty competitive trying to like see who can touch the wall first but um there's not any other female breaststrokers here really so yeah. in my squad there's George Smith and he does breaststroke so mm. he'll do a breaststroke set with me but usually I'm with like Holly McGill who does backstroke. The names that you've just listed there like i know sterling's known for kathleen duncan it is yeah. like there's a new generation that is yeah. coming through at sterling is it has it been helpful settling in that all of you have kind of gone there at the same time like i know they're starting to refresh with new faces and younger faces there i would say so having holly there definitely helped because she's joined the same year as me so we were trying to like figure out how to do things together but um I think it was a pretty smooth transition. Like everyone was so welcoming, and I think, like after, not that long, like it felt like we'd be in there for so long. Mm. So, mm. 
I think everyone is just really positive and genuinely wants the best for everyone, which is nice. Uh, for your perform- uh, personal performances, has it been a long time coming? Because you've got a, a big PB in the 200, like we've already talked about, the 100 as well as the 50. You kind of PB'd in all of them, roughly speaking. Has it been a long time coming, these, re- these results? Uh, I would say so. I think it's been down from my training since midsummer. So if that's a long time coming, I don't really know. But, um, <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we kind of hit the ground running with um, training then. And I'm definitely in my most motivated block of training I've ever been in. So I think I was really thinking about those times in training. <laughs> so what happens in training now that you've hit those? Like you had a really good short course season as mm. well. At Scottish short course. So, what happens between now and trials? Like, what is the focus going to be within training? Um, I think racing last season was all about like building that confidence and getting data. So now I kind of have that um, that ground where I can see, you know, how many strokes I go out in, how many strokes I come back in, mm. like the timing I should be going out in, which information I haven't really had before. So I think from that, like tweaking technical aspects but also you know using that data and just building from that so so can you give us a bit of an insight into what areas you think you need to improve on the most uh my underwaters <laughs> and okay. my dive i think that's definitely my weakness i think my stroke like there's some technical things like you know finishing the kick but the main thing for me where i lose time is definitely my start and underwater is that okay. due to lack of streamline or power what what's what part we're actually exactly? uh, working on that today with the camera it's it's um oh. it's kind of my body position like my legs kind of go up and then i just don't have like a catch but we're kind of like tweaking the timing um trying not to bury my head so much which like you know makes resistance so just kind of tweaking body position and like timing and stuff like that so if the start's a big focus, are you spending like one session a week with the camera or is it a half hour at the end of every session doing dives? What's How do you actually focus on that in like the grand scheme of a training program? Um, I would say we use them um, two times a week, but we spoke today about um, possibly increasing that, like leading up to trials, like doing more mm. video analysis and really kind of refining that because I think as I said, you know, seeing that really helps me and like breaking it down into mm. small parts. Cause when you're doing the pull out, it goes by so quickly and there's like, you know, so many things that you need to focus on. So it's also that like visualization, visualization aspect, isn't it? <laughs> like if you're sat behind the blocks ra- waiting to race and you say, okay, look, my, I've been working on my dive for f- trials is what, three, four months away. Mm hmm. I've seen my clip in my head. I can actually picture a video of me mm-hmm. doing this well now for, let's say it takes you a month to perfect it. You've got two months worth of video visualizations in your head that suddenly it becomes second yeah. nature. Like it becomes so much easier to um, have that process like, or yeah, to definitely. execute that process. Even then, like having, this is new as well. So like they video my heats and my final. Mm. So then like usually I kind of know where I went wrong just from doing it so many times but um like seeing that and then before the final like thinking like visualizing how that's going to change really helps I think visualization is like one of my biggest things before racing like but the night before I'm just like it's on repeat and I know exactly what I want to do so are you going to be racing a lot between now and trials then to keep practicing that yeah I think we um so I'm in Geneva and I leave on Wednesday. Um, okay. Edinburgh International. I think we're doing like a race simulation just here. Mm. And then I think champs. So not too many, but enough, I think. It's more than some that we've spoken to. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we've, um, we've spoken to Duncan and he kind of likes experimenting and stuff like that. Do you do, you do experimentations yourself? Like, like, for example, like the underwater pullout. Do you then play around doing do you do dolphin then they've pulled down or do you vice versa do you literally play around with stuff like that um i wouldn't say overly like i have played around with it before but i think 
I definitely have found like where I want the fly kick. I think it's more like timing. Um, I'm playing around with now to make like that breakout easier. Like when I start my kick after I bring my hands up, that's like a big thing mm. that I've been like trying to work on. Um, sometimes it feels a bit clunky, so it's trying to find like that optimal point where it's gonna, you know, make that breakout a lot smoother. Is there certain ways to improve that, or is it literally just a case of repetition, repetition? Repetition? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> just practice. That's swimming, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, should, we, should we take a look forward to what is, I presume, for every swimmer who we speak to over the next few months, the, the goal of this season, which is trials. So yeah. how much are you looking forward to racing in London? Because I presume as a West Suffolk swimmer, you swam there before, it's kind of... Yeah, your sort Close of home by. Olympic pool, mm -hmm. home, home Olympic pool, <laughs> home Olympic pool. <laughs> it, it's your like home fifty meter pool. Uh, yeah. You raced there before. Uh, I've actually never raced there. I used to train there like twice a week just to get long course training in. Okay, but um, so I'm familiar with it, but I've never actually raced there. But I'm excited. <laughs> I've I've heard, I've never raced there myself, but I've heard it's it's quite quick. I mean, really? I, have, you, have you raced at Ponds Forge? Because that's that's a quick yeah. pool. So um, I don't Forge. know if uh, you prefer <laughs> racing at a new pool compared to Ponds Forge. I actually do. I think um, I kind of like racing somewhere new. It's like I think Ponds Forge holds a lot of memories, good mm. and bad. But um, I think it'll be nice to have a change. I think mm. Champs has been there because I wasn't there. I think twenty twenty they were there. And I wasn't there for, for that the Olympics, one. They move it there, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think this is my first time chance hasn't been at Ponds Forge, which will be exciting. What, and what's your thoughts on trials then? Because obviously, we, I'm assuming you're targeting the Brestrock events, and the 100 Brestrock nomination time is it's pretty swift. You know, you've got to go pretty much a British record. So what do you, what do you think <laughs> yeah. on that? Um, I do think it's fast, but it's definitely keeping me on my toes. You know, you can't get that time and slack in training so it's definitely mm. Mm. keeping me motivated in the gym in the pool outside so um i think it'll be exciting i think there'll be a lot of promising brush opening swims this year looking yeah. at last season so i was gonna say the head to head like even if like you're in one of those events where there's a relay spot as well so like mm -hmm. the nomination time isn't the be all or end all like it it yeah. is important but you've actually got to beat all of the other girls in the Just pool to make one. the team as well. Yeah. So there's yeah. incredible swimmers. Like Cara Hanlon's been the stalwart of mm -hmm. uh, breaststroke swimming for the last two years. Um, mm -hmm. Then Imogen Clark, Lily Booker, Sienna Robinson, who else? Uh, Leah Sloshen, mm -hmm. Theodora, Theodora Taylor, Taylor coming through. through as well. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. there's some real depth making moves in the breaststroke. It always seems to be the way coming through at trials that mm -hmm. someone comes out of the woodwork. Um, yeah, and really improves. So, like, how much confidence do you take that you can actually get your hand on the ball first, given the massive drops you've already seen in season? Um, I think every swimmer who has a lane has a chance. So it's mm. like I'm never gonna be fully confident. Um, I'm confident that I can do better than Rotterdam, <laughs> faster than Rotterdam. Okay, okay. I think well, with the training that I've been doing. Um, you know, it is looking promising, but, you know, as I said, everyone else is training hard. Everyone else, you know, has their head down. So I think it's just, you know, oh, I could not guess he was going to get it. <laughs> Are you a swimmer who races the race or races the clock? The race. Definitely yeah. the race. I get really nervous before I race and I just kind of like look at everyone and I'm like, I'm just, <laughs> I just want to win. That's hard on Brasho because you're looking forward to something. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I see the splash. I think that's enough for me. But um, <laughs> I think because you don't actually see the clock and, you know, everyone kind of has their times that they want to go. Mm. So I think just like, and you know, everyone, you know, around you is really good swimmers. So just having them next to you is, you know, motivation enough, I think. Mm. it's confidence as well if you're a nervous swimmer to know that look, i'm in a final next to let's say cara who's almost mm -hmm. got that nomination time already this year yeah like it's, it is a confidence builder do you have you got any tricks up your sleeve to help with nerves if you're a nervous swimmer i think i just embrace them at this point you know okay. one mm. of my 
my worst swims have been when I haven't been nervous. So it definitely okay, kind so of eggs me on. Thing. Yeah. Um, but it kind of, so if I'm really nervous, I'll listen to like kind of happier music. So I'm not like as nervous, but then if I'm not nervous enough, then I'll listen to like more angry music to like get me to that like optimal point. I of like nerves, that. You're, but... you're embracing the nerves. You want yeah. to go towards them. <laughs> Honestly, it's no. funny you should say that because I was a nervous swimmer as well and, and still <laughs> nervous now about most things. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to do exactly the same thing. I, I found myself, I remember being at Millfield for regionals and I just wasn't, it wasn't working. Mm-hmm. Something wasn't psyched up enough. And so I was like a big Linkin Park fan back then. I, I needed that to bring out a yeah. performance. It's interesting you should say that. It's like almost identical to what my mentality was as well. Yeah, I recently started using, so this season I've used caffeine gum for the first time. And before okay. I would just have like a coffee on the way to the pool. And I find that really helpful with like getting my nerves where I need them to be. How'd you come back down after that? Like I, <laughs> like, just genuine, well. genuine question for swimmers because I know I've seen at trials I've seen the guys go past me with a black coffee at like five o'clock yeah. at night. I'm like, how do you sleep after that for try the for the next day? Um, not very well. <laughs> I'm kind of using like cherry juice. I think okay. that's meant okay. to help, but some people say it works. Some people say it doesn't. I use that in Rotterdam and um. I don't really think that had much of an effect, but, um, you know, lights off early, try and, you know, unwind, but it's harder. It's harder than you think. <laughs> I, I need to, I think I need to try cherry juice, Dan. I've, I've got a baby <laughs> at home. I'm on caffeine all day until about eight o'clock at night. And then oh, I need no. to switch off very quickly after. I know, oh, it, no. it can't be good for you. I don't know how you're still like <laughs> functioning <laughs> properly. Insane. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, Ang Harrod, it's been great talking to you. What we usually do to finish this podcast is we do some quick fire questions to race oh, through God. so we get to know you a little bit better. Okay. So what is your favorite event in swimming? 50 brushstroke. Uh, who is your swimming idol? Um, Dan Pilbrow. Oh, Ooh. nice, your coach. I like it. Uh, <laughs> what's your proudest moment in swimming so far? Um, making European juniors for the first time. What is the hardest set? you've ever done um 40 25's best average doesn't sound hard but it is <laughs> how much rest do you turn around on that like five ten seconds <laughs> ah, so it's just oh flat out it's just uh, yeah flat out okay okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh and to get to know you a little bit away from a swimming pool if you were to go on a road trip there's three spaces in the car you can take friends family celebrities anyone you want who do you take um, with you my two dogs Yes. And oh, two dogs. Two, two big old English sheep dogs and oh, wow. probably one of my best friends. <laughs> oh, I love that car. We are big dog fans. We've, yeah. we've had loads of people say one dog in the car before, but not two. You're the first one who said two. So. Yeah, it's a um, big fluffy dog, so hairs everywhere, barking, wow. saliva. Of course. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dream. Well, th- thank you so much for coming on to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. Best of luck with the camera work, the training well, <laughs> over the winter months, uh, the next few racing opportunities. We're going to be at Edinburgh International, so we might see you there. Um, and yeah, best of luck going into trials because I think a lot of people sat up uh, your performances at Rotterdam um, mm. and exciting times ahead. Thank you. I look forward to it. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what I'm really looking forward to as well. If you can drop that many seconds in not a short, a, a very short amount of time, then mm. you know when it comes to trials, I, we're going to be very much on the edge of our seats watching those races that you do. So yeah, best of luck for when trials comes around. Embrace the nerves. Thank you. Mm. I'll embrace the nerves. <laughs> so Dan, like we kind of ended that podcast, the strength of breaststroke in the women's scene in Britain is strong. There's some names moving through in this country, and Ang Harrod has certainly stuck her head above the parapet at the start of the end of 2023, the start of this season. We sat up, we took notice, others have as well, um, and it's really interesting to hear almost the progress is being made not in terms of like building a massive aerobic base. It's been really technical by the sounds of it. It's been the details and staying within the sprint kind of program that she's used to Hmm. That is making the difference. I suppose breaststroke is technically the most that, technical that stroke. Yeah. <laughs> that, did that just make sense? I'm not it even did, sure that made did, sense. It did. Um, so I think the use of video analysis, because it's, it's mm. instant feedback. 
because the swimmer can see it, obviously, so can the coach, and then you can both have your ideas and spitball, which I know Steve and Bradley up there are very good personally at trying to communicate that sort of thing, so like this could work, this might not work, th- those sort of things. And I think that's what Ang Harrod has clutched on the most, and that's why I think she is loving swimming at the moment, because she didn't, like she said, she didn't enjoy swimming going back a couple of years, and now she's suddenly found a little love for it again. And I wonder if it's because of that and because she feels more human, I think, the, the words she was to use, rather they than treated her being... Like a, a yeah, they, they treat her as a human. So I wonder if that's maybe the the thing that's switched in her head for, me, for her to enjoy swimming more. Yeah, we've always said on this podcast, the way that Stephen Bradley run the program up in Sterling, it's, it's a tiny bit different. You kind of have to go there to see. Yeah. Um, Bradley is a comedian on poolside. Let's, <laughs> let's not beat around the bush. He is a very funny guy. And the fact that his relationship with a swimmer, with Ang Harrod, is getting the best out of her mm. is is brilliant. Um, and I'm really glad that she like she she mentioned a little bit in the podcast that she didn't overly enjoy her time in Georgia. Like that's a big life experience going over to race in the states, especially for a European junior swimmer like herself, to then find her feet back after a bad experience and go up to Sterling and like it sounds like she's loving swimming again. Like you said, like that to me is a massive takeaway from this podcast more than maybe like the time she's dropping yeah i, th- I suppose that that we should probably mention that the, the 200 breaststroke time drop off has been <laughs> yeah. massive and actually my biggest takeaway was something that resonates most with me is the nerves that she still deals with yeah and the fact that she embraces the nerves which is something i have to you need still to do, do. This. i still do it actually <laughs> um rather than worry about it because then the more you worry and the more you stress about things the the worse it gets and so well, you she- say that but she said that sometimes when the nerves aren't there, she likes to bring them up. So, <laughs> well, that's probably because she's controlled them a bit more. I imagine. Uh, so yeah, okay. I, I don't know. I probably should have asked her that. Like, how else do you control it? She talked about visualization and mm. you know thinking about things on the block. And Lauren Cox does the same sort of thing. And she I wonder did, if it's yeah. the same way of dealing with nerves. I suppose. So yeah, a very good message from her there. Absolutely. Um, certainly a name that we are going to be paying attention to over the next few months, especially Definitely. how she gets on. Like you would have heard in the podcast, she's racing in Geneva. When this goes live, she's raced in Geneva, just yeah. to peek behind the scenes. But she's going to be at the Edinburgh International in like a month and a half's time, uh, which is going to be exciting to see because she's really starting to challenge the likes of Cara Hanel. She did in the short course season. Um, so I'm really excited to see what happens come London. Yeah. Now... Next week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, we won't have a guest on, but that is because we are previewing the World Championships that are happening out in Doha. A little bit of a curveball. British women have sent a big squad, a very strong squad, to the World Championships. I think when we first spoke about Worlds last year, we said, oh, no one's going to want to go to Doha because of where it is. Well, that's not the case. Like Speaking around, a lot of the swimmers actually did want to go. which I had is the, why I, I had the feeling it was going to go one of two ways. It was either just the the relay fly and fly out, or they actually send a whole team. So it seems they've gone down that route, and I assume they won't be tapering for it. So they they have all gone down that route. There's some big paydays on the line, mm-hmm, some weekend true. fields, which means a lot of British medals could be on the way. So next week's podcast, we're going to be previewing it all. We're going to be talking about it. We're going to be discussing why British swimming have sent such a big squad to Doha with the Olympics right on the horizon. Now, if you want to be one of the first people to hear that episode, make sure you've subscribed on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. And me and Dan will be back in seven days' time. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.